Talmor, Jeshin Mugachi. Talmor is my home. My family have worked the land for generations. My gran says the island does not belong to us, but we belong to the island. And we must be ready for a great evil is coming. And death follows with it. Listen and subscribe to the latest season of Undertow, The Harrowing, a story glass production presented by Realm, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And now, a special edition of the Toddcast podcast. And how good do you feel knowing that the light at the end of the COVID tunnel is within sight? The world is slowly but surely opening up again. I mean, you look and you see the NHL games in the States anyway. They have a substantial amount of fans in the stands. Green Day and Weezer, Alice Cooper, 311. Tons of bands have recently announced summer and fall 2021 tours. It's coming around. Lots has changed in the past few months. And we have had some incredible guests in that time. Everyone was willing, oddly enough, to jump on a Zoom call, do an interview, and that's what this week is all about. You'll hear from nine guests in this Best of 2021 podcast. My name is Todd Hancock. Thank you so much for being there. There's lots of choices in the podcast world, and we don't take it for granted that you're here. A reminder that you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and our YouTube channels. We're also part of the Dean Blundell Network out of Toronto. Find him at deanblundell.com. Now that said, let's get to this best of podcast and highlights of some of this year's musical guests, all of whom are brought to you by Pineapple Sound, a recording and mixing studio in Langley since 2013. They also welcome podcasts, voiceover actors, and a lot more as well. Check them out through pineapplesound.com. I think we mentioned this when she was a guest. You'll know the Pretty Reckless's singer Taylor Momsen from The Grinch with Jim Carrey. She was little Cindy Lou Who. She was also Jenny in Gossip Girl, but Taylor was a guest because of the music, not the acting. She formed the band in New York City in 2009. They released their debut the following year, queue up multiple hit songs, not only in the US, but also in the UK rock charts. World tours, it really is quite impressive. And when Taylor was a guest, it was right around the time that they released their fourth album, Death by Rock and Roll, and she talked about recording one of the songs on that album with Kim and Matt of Soundgarden. How cool is that? Well, we... You know, it kind of stems from a, you know, kind of a sad story, but, um, you know, we were opening for Soundgarden on their, on that last tour, um, which was incredible. I mean, it was the highest of highs. Like I couldn't, I couldn't believe that we were there like (laughs) opening for Soundgarden. Like it was, it blew my mind. It It was absolutely the most amazing experience. And then, you know, it obvious. And so I became friends with them on that tour and, um, you know, it obviously ended, uh, very, tragically which you know with the with the passing of Chris that that took everyone by surprise but really that really crushed me in a way that I still don't know how to put into words um and it kind of took me down this 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 rabbit hole of you know de- de- depression and substance abuse and everything that comes with loss and you know and because sh- shortly after we lost Chris we also like we went through a lot of hits in the pretty reckless world um shortly after the music world lost Chris we I, I found myself not in a good place to be public like I I came to that conclusion fairly quickly of like I I can't get on stage every night and pretend that I'm okay when I'm kind of falling apart inside and so I I canceled touring and and went home to kind of regroup and um and process and and as soon as I kind of started to get my feet back on the ground I I got a phone call that our producer Cato had died in a motorcycle accident and that was just the 
nail in the coffin for me where I just spiraled down like very quickly into, you know, this hole of darkness that I didn't really know how to get out of. And sorry, I'm kind of rambling now, but to, to make a very long story, it's, there's no way to not talk about these things um, while speaking about the album because it's just, it's, it's such a part of it. Um, and so to make a very long story short, it was, it was music was the thing that I turned to that really kind of pulled me out of this funk. Um, you know, when I finally picked up a guitar again and, and started to write, I, I feel like I didn't, I feel like this record's different in a lot of ways in the sense that I didn't really have to try to write it. I kind of, it just kind of poured out of me whether I wanted it to or not. Um, it was like all these, all these emotions and all these things that I had been feeling and that like repressing for, you know, months on end, as soon as I kind of, you know, cracked that door open, it was like a dam exploding and it just all overflowed. And that, that in itself was very cathartic. Like that was kind of the first step of me um, healing and getting my life back on track, I guess. And so anyway, <laughs> back to Matt and Kim, <laughs> I wrote the song Only Love Can Save Me Now. And, uh, and just, I love that song. And just due to the, you know, the, the kind of overall vibe of it, I just, I thought that, you know, Matt and Kim's just incredible, masterful musicianship, they would add such a, a weight and a quality to it that would really take the song to the next level and, and really see it through to its full potential. So I sent them a demo of it and said, would you guys want to, would you guys want to play on this? Like, I think that this could be really awesome. Um, <laughs> and they listened and said, yeah. And, and the experience was fantastic. I mean, we, we actually recorded, it was one of the last songs we recorded for the record. Um, we did it in Seattle at the legendary London Bridge Studios, which is, you know, where Soundgarden made Louder Than Love and Pearl Jam made 10 and Alice in Chains made Dirt. And, um, Yes. you know so many other records so just so to be there like and I'm a firm believer that like spaces are kind of like people they hold memories and energy and you know inside the walls and so just walking in there and it was incredible you could just feel you could feel it you know and and then to be there with Matt and Kim and have Kim walk around and point to everything on the wall and have a story about it was just absolutely amazing and then to get to the actual recording of it to hear that song come to life for the first time in a real way like the first time Matt hits his snare and the first note that Kim plays it just exploded out of the speakers of pure and utter awesomeness that only they can deliver and it just you literally absolutely incredible can you see this my hair are, no I know I still get goosebumps it was standing up right now like freaking <laughs> sound garden is helping you with a song like it's absolutely insane and like I don't I don't want to speak for them because that's not my place but um but I love them I love them so much like I I, I there's not just as musicians, which is like, obviously, I don't have to say that, but as people, like, they're so incredibly kind, like they're everything you want them to be and more like it's, you yeah. know, you always hear don't meet your idols because you know, I can go south really quickly. And like, they, there's so much, there's, uh, I, I don't have words. I just, I love, I love you guys, Matt, Kim, yeah. Ben, you know, I like, I love you guys. And, um, and it just, I'm so grateful that they were a part of this and, and, uh, and it was just this very full circle moment, like after all this hell, like to, to be there together, creating something new, I, I felt like it was this very beautiful moment um, and really just shows kind of the healing power of music. There's a few reasons you'll know Todd Morse. He formed the punk band H2O with his brother Toby. He's lead guitarist in Juliet and the Licks. He started a punk band called Operation MD with Cone from Sum 41. He's the touring bassist for The Offspring. It's impressive stuff, and he's a really nice guy as well. Had a great chat. We got to talking about comic book-based TV shows and specifically why he loved WandaVision. We reminisced about when we were young and that ritual of reading rock magazines like Spin and Rolling Stone and Circus. It's a slow burn start, and, and a lot totally. of my, I mean, a, a lot of my friends like uh, uh, Pete Parada, the drummer from Offspring, and, and our, our new backing guitar player Jonah Nimoy they, they're super comic book guys and they they were said the same thing like they weren't sure at first and then they were just fully in um what I love about it it's it's the first superhero series that I could watch with my kids and like my daughter I come home from like a rehearsal or something my daughter's like new WandaVision new WandaVision like yeah you know, she's, she's seven you know yeah. and, like, and you know some of it's a little scary and she it's the first time she's been able to watch like something that intense you know it, yeah, and and I think the so, what, yeah. what what I like about it is it goes back to when we were little kids, where we had to wait till next Friday to see the next 
cheers or you know, know what i mean like i know like it, 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 it's kind of nostalgic for us right yeah i mean if we're going to really get you know into the metaphors here it's the same thing with having to wait for a record to come out before you heard it or having to go to the store to buy it it it, it creates this appreciation and anticipation of art uh that i don't know i i just think it's a give it to me now nation you know like oh yeah you know that the 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 dead kennedys were way ahead of their time with give me convenience or give me death you know yes like <laughs> it's yeah like, big time you I know because think... that, that that was the other part of you know growing up as a kid it wasn't only just waiting for the albums but it was also you know you didn't have internet and if you wanted to learn about the band you best be buying rolling stone and spin and circus and all those other totally yeah oh, i love looking and, at spin back in the yeah, day yeah man you know, and it was like, you know, the I don't know if you got Good Rockin' Tonight where you're from, but it's essentially, you know, MTV or, you know, much music yeah. kind of thing. But like all of those yeah. TV shows, too, were very, like, super influential for yeah. a, a guy that was a, or a girl that were music fans. Did you guys have 120 Minutes up there? 120 MTV minutes. 120 Minutes. It came on at midnight. No. Do you remember that? No. No. What was that, that was where, like, you know, that was where we first saw, for, you know, the first Offspring video, the first Faith the More video. Uh, oh, okay. You know, like, that was our, like, you stay up till midnight to, to see something new and cool in, in music videos, you know. Right. That was, yeah. Uh, no, we had the uh, Good Rockin' Tonight. Um, yeah. And then, uh, uh, yeah, the Friday Night videos. And Friday Night videos yeah. was fucking awesome because they would play, like, everything. Like every yeah. go from Van Halen jump to like Duran Duran, hungry like the wolf, or you know, yeah, just yeah. it was all over the map, but it was cool. Yeah, Did I remember you... seeing the, the first time I saw the Crow Mags was I, I believe it or not. Now, now I'm friends with you know John and and those guys, but that we got a no video was oh yeah, it's like oh my god, these guys are scary. <laughs> <laughs> and Blacklist Royals were supposed to tour in 2020, celebrating their 10th anniversary. Instead, no touring, no touring for you. They released a three-song EP called Doomsday Girl instead. The band was formed by twins Nat and Rob Rufus. You gotta love a couple brothers touring the world together, creating the best memories. Drummer Rob was recently a guest, and this German women's prison story is top-notch. We played in a women's prison in, in Germany. Uh, how, did, how did that get hooked up? Like, what? what? It, it, was, it was this crazy thing, like... We were going over on tour and, and our our booking agent, I, I think it was, was like, if you guys want to do a day, like whatever town it was in, I don't even remember the fucking town, but like whatever the town was, they were like, if you guys want to do a day show at the prison, you'll get paid like five times as much as you're getting paid at the actual show. And, and, and I was like, the women, like, not only will we do it, like, we want to fucking like record it and put, we and release it to record it and release it. Fuck and, yeah. um, and it was going to be called caged heat. And wow. I was like, so fucking excited that, um, we had in our minds, like Johnny Cash at Folsom prison Totally. And it was like not, <laughs> it was like this weird, like very intimidating kind of thing. And, um, and, and it sucked for my brother too, because we were, we had worked out on the stage banner and we were covering like Thin Lizzie's Jailbreak and like oh, no. Jailhouse Rock and shit like that, because we wanted to put it on the record. Yeah. And, um, and like, so, when it actually went down, they brought the prisoners out and it was like really weird and intimidating. And they're kind of like cat calling us in German and no. shit. And, uh, and I, and I just kind of kept my eyes down the whole time, but he had to like, I was like, you still got to do the stage banter. So he's saying like, this song goes, I'll tell you jail birds and shit no. like that. <laughs> and, uh, and it was actually, it, but then it was actually really awesome because we finished the show and we were like outside. And so they had some girls in the yard, but then it was like an old prison. Like it looked like the prison from Shawshank Redemption or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's girls like hanging out of their cells and they start throwing down, like they had uh, printed off like flyers about the show 
and like throwing him down to for us to sign him. And it was really like, I just go, I never in my life imagined I would, my picture would be up in a, in women, a women's prison in Germany. Yeah, like, this is <laughs> such a huge milestone in my life. Like, and it was all of a sudden, like, this is fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, Dude, fucking, do, 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 do. did you yeah. guys actually oh, fucking do jailbreak? It, yeah, yeah, we did. And we actually went from, it was like a medley of prison <laughs> songs. It was like so poorly thought out. Like, tonight and, uh, is going to be a jailbreak. Yeah, we did jailbreak into jailhouse rock. That's and, awesome. Uh, uh, and the, then the fucked up thing is the, the tape messed up and we didn't even get to use the. Oh. Recording. and it was such a bummer because it was such a great weird experience yeah totally yeah i was but like it, when i read that i'm like fuck i gotta ask him about that man that had to be yeah, like, that's gotta know, be up yeah. there for nobody yeah. nobody ever asks about that and it was such mm. a funny and and there was actually one uh there was one prisoner who was like saying something in that and and she had like a really bad outbreak of something all over her face and uh, the the guard was like, she's saying she wants to kiss you. And that's like, oh, I don't think that's allowed. And the, he goes, no, it's fine. And let her out. And she comes over and like plants this huge kiss on him. And the next day he woke up and he had shit all over his was breaking out of oh, his face. No. Like, oh, my God. It's something to remember me by. Yeah, yeah, and uh, for wow. the rest of your fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> Musical guests of the Toddcast podcast are powered by Pineapple Sound, providing recording and mixing services for a wide range of artists and genres since 2013. Check them out at pineapplesound.com. This I gotta be honest, I was expecting nothing less than an ass kicker from that band. The band is Poor Sport, a great new song for them, great new song for the podcast, Tearing at the Seams. They're from Victoria, the lone non-Vancouver band of the week. And even though they're new, you will know a bit about them through this podcast. They rise from the ashes of No Liars, which is a band that we've played for years and years. They've played podcast shows for us at the railway. And for whatever reason, I didn't really dig into it. The band folded and a few of the guys created that band, Poor Sport. And they're trudging along once again, was texting with Noah from the band a while back. And, and once we can safely do it, expect us to dial up something live 
with those guys. Coming up in about 15 minutes, in listen to this, Smashing Pumpkins drummer Jimmy Chamberlain talking about Drummer Magazine and a very cool career highlight. That is powered by Tedco RV Supplies, RV Service and Repair, ICBC accredited. Find them online through TedcoRVSuppliesInc.com. First, let's get to more guests in this best of podcast and highlights from some of our recent sporting guests, all of whom are brought to you by Joyce Heating Services, family owned and operated, heating the lower mainland since 1960. Our resident fitness guru, fitness influencer Jessica Kiernan made her third appearance a few months back now, I guess. we get Every couple of years we grab her. You'll love what she's all about. Super inspiring, one of the most engaging people that we follow on social media. Always lots of great advice and lots of pictures, lots of videos. And this last time around, Jessica stressed the importance of drinking water and what it does for you. Here's something that we should all pay attention to. It flushes out all the toxins. Um, it definitely helps release uh, like body fat. So it helps you actually get leaner. Um, even there's like water tricks to do, like when we were doing our competitions, you know, water was such an important um, part of the process. You have to stay hydrated. You have to keep your muscles hydrated. Um, it's, it's everything. So it keeps you energized. You know, it can fill you up, but it is really healthy for your body. And it actually does help lower your body fat. Mm. It's kind of, it's kind yeah, of interesting. They always say it, right? They always say, we're like, yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, drink more water. No, you won't. No, but you yeah. should. You should drink more water. Yeah. Yeah. And I always have my little tricks for water. I always put like lemon in it or lemon juice or... If you follow NHL hockey, even in the slightest, you're going to know Sean Avery. 12 seasons, signed with the Red Wings in 1999, played with the Kings, the Stars, and the Rangers as well, was no stranger to some controversy. I mean, the guy has a rule named after him for his shenanigans trying to distract Brodeur, the Avery rule. Sean finished his NHL career with 90 goals, 247 points, 1,533 penalty minutes in 580 games. So we had to find out from those penalty minutes which ones stood out the most in his mind oh boy um man i think there was a game in chicago where uh at the end of uh it was sort of at the end of a shift i got into a scrum with bob probert and i kind of took a shot at him like a, a, a cheap shot that i shouldn't have and I remember going to the penalty box and thinking, like, I wish I could just stay here for the rest of the game and not have to come back out of there. Because I, I knew, like, I, I saw his eyes kind of glaze over, and I, I, I thought he was going to kill me. So at that point, I was thinking, if I, if I could just stay in the box the whole game, I wouldn't have to come back out. That's probably the one time where I, I can really remember sitting in there pondering life. And you'll know Denise Kielholtz from fighting in Bellator MMA, which oddly almost didn't even happen after she lost her first pro MMA fight by submission in October 2015. That almost made her stop and just concentrate on kickboxing, which she's been doing since 2004. Denise is currently Bellator's kickboxing flyweight champion and is working her way to be the women's flyweight overall champ. And I did the MMA fight and I lost, but but really with a strange arm bar in a stand up position, it was like crazy. And um, after that, I told myself because I was I it was not that I take it easy on it, but I thought oh I was winning everything with kickboxing. I had black belt judo, so I thought at that time I can I can do also an MMA fight, you know. Mm -hmm. But then it gets like worse because then I go in there, I'm standing against a Brazilian girl and she was really like on the ground, really good. And so I think I underestimate the sport because I standing there and I think I'm just going to fight my kickboxing thing, you know. And then I got in in an arm bar, really, really like tight and I have to tap. And after that, that was like... I think 2015, that was like five years from now. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that fight, after the MMA fight, I say to myself, I'm never, ever going to do MMA again. (laughs) I'm not good at it. This is not my thing. I thought I can do it, but I couldn't. And I lost. And I that loss, that was also the emotional pain that I had because, you know, in my face or something, I don't care. But... 
in, inside, you know, you get so, so hurt that it's like, that's the worst pain you can ever have. And even that, that pain caused me that I was like, banded MMA in my life forever, you know? So then I started kickboxing again. And then I start with, with uh, Bellator kickboxing and I win and I win again a world title and then again. And then after, so from, I think, two or three years from that fight that I lost, Bellator asked me, would you want to fight an MMA fight? Mm. And that first thought that I was thinking about, because I was like totally banded MMA in my life, I was thinking, okay, how can I, okay, what, can I really do this again, MMA? You know, I, I don't know if I'm really good at it. So I trained, but in the back of my mind, I still had that fight, that first fight. So I was like confident, but not really like the confidence that I always had. Right. And in that fight, it was in Israel against Jessica Middleton and uh, the, the fight for Bellator MMA. And the crowd was like, boom. And Jessica Middleton was also a really good fighter. You know, she was really good in the stand up and she had also like the, the purple belt in BAA. So I thought, OK, that was really like my mind was there so focused about other side, can I do this? And the other side, you have to do this. So that was a confusing part, the mental issue. But, you know, that was what, what my husband has seen. He, he saw in my face before we walked into the cage. He saw my face from, hey, you're not like Denise that I used to mm -hmm. know. You know? He, mm -hmm. he, because then the, the, the little... The little thoughts in my mind came, hey, think about the first MMA fight that you fought, you lost, you cannot do this, you cannot right. do this, you know, and then you get smaller, smaller, and I was already standing on the catwalk, and then uh, my husband told me, wake up, you know, this is your dream, this, you want this, you're standing here, look at the crowd, look at the cage, this is your dream, don't think about the past, think about what you are doing now. So he's just giving me that that wake up call and I'm walking on the catwalk and I'm thinking, yeah, what the hell am I thinking about? Oh, you know, snap out of it. No, this is this, I'm not going to lose. And then after that fight, you know, uh, I think I was never, ever so happy in my life before than that fight, because just like 10 minutes before the fight, I was thinking, hey, can I really do this? And then after that, because I won in 30 seconds. I won with an arm bar. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that was something, you know, that I was so happy that you, like, you you win from your mind, you know. It's not the win from Jessica Milton or the win in the fight, but that was really like a victory for my mind because 10 minutes ago I was thinking about losing and now I'm standing here dancing and celebrate my win, you know. So how crazy a mind can change like the whole situation, the whole direction. But right. after that fight, I knew, okay, this is what I want to be the champion in. And I still have that thousand percent focus still <laughs> right now. Sporting guest visits of the Toddcast podcast are powered by Joyce Heating Services, a family owned and operated heating business serving the lower mainland since 1960. Online at JoyceHeating.com.
listening to the best of episode. And now, listen to this on the Toddcast Podcast. You could argue that the Smashing Pumpkins are one of the most influential bands of the 90s. They're from Chicago. They formed in 1988, over 30 years ago. That make you feel old? Their second album, 1993's Siamese Dream, blew them wide open with rock radio stations across North America, adding them to the playlists forevermore. Their next album, 1995's Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, debuted number one on Billboard. That album sold over 20 million albums worldwide. And when their drummer, Jimmy Chamberlain, was a guest, he talked about the importance of family, being named one of the best rock drummers on the planet. We talked about near-death stories, playing D&D, Dungeons and Dragons, the early days of the Pumpkins, the Zwan Project came up, and Jimmy talked about Modern Drummer Magazine and one of his awesome career highlights. Listen to this. I mean, again, it's really, you know, the whole thing was kind of a highlight. Um... I would say, you know, again, I mean, probably for me as a musician, really probably that first Modern Drummer cover yeah. was probably the biggest moment. I mean, because, you know, as a kid, I mean, that's what I did. I read Modern Drummer. I mean, I sat and stared at those covers, stared at those ads, and just thought, man, what if I practice more than anybody, right? <laughs> and, you know, when, when, I, when I ended up uh, on the cover, it was a real, uh, real dream come true. Listen to this on the Toddcast podcast is brought to you by Tedco RV Supplies in Langley, an ICBC-approved repair shop. Find them online at tedcorvsuppliesinc.com.
And there you have it, some new music for the podcast. That band is called Mad Symphony, and a cool song for them called Sell Me Out, another jewel in Vancouver scene, without a doubt. These guys formed, do you remember a Seattle band called Soulbender? If you remember those guys. I played you a relatively new song for Cobra Ramon called Black Mountain. I think that those guys were one of the last bands to have played a podcast show for us. I think it was early 2020, maybe late 2019. It was one of those cheap thrill shows that we do where I host from stage. There's a Q&A. There's the acoustic performance with the band. It was a fantastic night. You can hear it on our YouTube and our SoundCloud channels. Speaking of live music, find Pandemic Distance and those live stream shows with the indie scene at toddhancock.ca. If you're playing one or maybe you're checking it out, share it with us and we'll put it up on the website. That's brought to you by Mystic Rhythms Rehearsal Studios, 40 plus years experience in the music industry. When the time comes to jam, check them out through mysticrhythms.ca. Okay, our final guests of this episode 249, a best of podcast, highlights from some of our entertainment guests, all of whom are Brought to you by Sacred Meds, the best craft cannabis and psilocybin dispensary in Canada. Use the code TODDCAST, 10% off your entire order. Check them out through sacredmeds.com. Weed, mushrooms, hash, bath bombs, and like so many good things. Caramels, gummies. It's insane. Now we had on Mo Amir, the host of the This Is Van Color podcast a couple of months back now. He's an absolute beauty and just smashing it locally, has a big following, has a growing following. He's super engaging on social media. He was on CKNW for a minute doing a weekly feature, although that recently got taken away from him, which is a stupid move. If you ask me, he was about as close as what you can get for news radio, what they should be doing, just plenty of drive and determination initiative. And when Mo was a guest, we talked about the decimation of smaller music venues across Canada because of the pandemic shutdowns. What an absolute shame. Yeah. And I worry about that, you know, because you look at Vancouver's comedy scene and I'm sure the music scene is like this as well, but these smaller venues are the training grounds for the people you see at the bigger stages, yeah. right? You need that ecosystem and it all starts from those smaller rooms. I mean, for comedy, it starts with rooms where there's literally 20 people. Like 20 people. So <laughs> yeah. that's, the same, that's the same for bands too, though. Like, yeah. you can't, like if you can't, if you only bring in 20, 50 people, if, if you bring that many to a 500 seat room, it looks empty. Yeah, exactly. So, but that's how you start out. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and some, and again, sometimes it's garbage, but sometimes it's, it's magic in, in those 20 people rooms. Right. And so it will be interesting to see what Vancouver looks like post COVID. I'm just as a comedy fan, I'm quite worried. And I have a lot of friends who are in comedy. I'm quite worried for, for that scene because I know everyone, even some of the guys like an Ivan Decker who has like a, a Juno award now for best comedy album, you know, they need those small rooms to work on their material. You know, they're not going to headline yuck yucks with unproven material. The unproven material gets practiced in these smaller rooms. And so if these guys don't have that ecosystem, you might see a lot of migration to Toronto or uh, you know, even the United States, if they can, Somewhere. it's a tough process, but yeah. you know, they'll leave. And people talk about Vancouver being a, a fun city or no fun city. And it's all an ecosystem. It's not just the big club or the big restaurant on the beach. It's all these little venues that, that make a city cool and awesome. Right. right? And I hope that whether it's the city or the province, when we start looking at rebuilding, we do, I mean, obviously health and, and safety and, and getting people uh, food on table is, is of the utmost priority. But I think when we look at urban planning, we have to start looking at these smaller venues and are they supported? Otherwise the whole city is just going to be cactus club and, and, uh, wow. and Earl's and, and no yeah. offense to them, but you know, they belong in the ecosystem just as anyone else. But when it's all uh, homogenous, it's not, it's not fun. I'd be willing to bet if you know Marina Valmont, it's because she's a host of Naked News. Now, she's also a Twitch streamer. She creates content for Tempted, has a big following, like 130, 140,000 people are following her on social media. And when she was a guest, we talked about being comic book nerds, going to comic cons, and that she does cosplay. I am. I Love am. It. I go to comic cons, fan okay. expos, I cosplay. 
Nice. And that's something I do on Twitch too. Okay. So what's the best uh, um, outfit that you've worn to a Comic-Con? I don't want to be typical with my uh, Harley Quinn answer. Yeah. But uh, actually, no. No, I got body painted for New York Comic-Con and I covered it for Naked News. I was Venom. Oh, nice. Yeah. What did they do with your face and the tongue and all that? What And the big ass teeth and... No, no tongue, but like my body was really cool. I had contacts on and it was yeah. the whole like gray black theme. It was like, well, very, yeah. very cool. really, I scared a lot of people that day. And Lachlan Cross, Locker, Lock, he's a longtime Canadian radio personality, currently doing mornings for Cruise FM in Edmonton. He and I go way back to 1997. Prince George, he was the midday guy, the music director for a station that I was working for doing the evening show at the Max FM 94. That was my second job in radio. He and I worked together for almost four years together. And we're generally cut from the same cloth, a no holds barred kind of guy, pulls no punches, tell it like it is. And when you're doing a radio show and the PC line continually shifting, navigating those waters as an on-air performer, it can be tricky. It's weird though, because the line has moved on content too, though. Do you know what I mean? Like it's shifted. There's... Like, you mean that in, in terms of what you can talk about, what's allowed to be talked about, PC stuff, yes. is that what you mean? Yeah, but people go, yeah, is it more politically moving. correct? Yeah. The line just moves around. Constantly There's just moving. stuff you can't talk about. You just don't touch. You just leave it alone. But then there's stuff that I would never have been able to talk about 10, 15, 20 years ago that we get away with now. Right. Like, we got a pretty edgy show, but we avoid a lot of things because I just know it's just going to get us into trouble. Right. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it for that three minute break, two minute break. Like exactly. It's not worth it. I had a conversation with somebody today. I was explaining, I had a nickname for a doctor in town. So everybody has these COVID, these COVID updates, right? Yeah. And, um, and this guy, this, this friend of mine, he was, he's very curious about radio, right? So he asks me a lot of questions and he was asking me about this one particular conversation that he owed me, overheard me having on the air with this woman. So the COVID updates, the Alberta COVID updates, there's always the doctor that comes out and then the politician will talk. You guys have them in BC. Yep. So she's the head of, her name's Dr. Hinshaw and okay. she's the head of the, um, the, the, the doctor's association. So she takes the lead in these press conferences around dinner time. She's yep. the one that updates us on the numbers. She she's uh, our Dr. Bonnie Henry. Done. Yeah. So Dr. Hinshaw in Alberta, and then you and her, uh, you're she's blonde, right? She's got a yep. bob. Yep. Okay. So Dr. Hinshaw has these very severe bangs. So I was calling her Dr. Bangs. Not to be not sexually disparaging. Bangs. Yeah, yeah. Like bangs, bangs. Yeah. Dr. Bangs. And so somebody called me up and said, and I ran this call. Somebody called me up and said, I find that offensive. And this woman gave me her name. We recorded the phone call and she said, I've been listening to you for quite a few years. I've never complained. And, um, but this is, this is just, it's wrong. I don't like the nickname. I think you need to stop. And um, I said to her, I said, absolutely. I, I can totally stop. I don't need, I don't, I, what am I gaining from continuing totally. to call her Dr. Bangs? It, uh, no we problem. can be funny in another way. Sure. Right. Yeah. I didn't realize it was offending anybody, but she had a point. She presented her case. She had a great point. I've stopped calling her that on the radio. I actually even feel bad even mentioning it on this podcast, but anyway. That's the I, only piece of stuff I'm going to use for the teasing of this. Now <laughs> just keep tagging the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I completely stopped. And I also, I went back in and looked at all her texts to us over the last five years. She is a long time listener. She's texted us a hundred times and not once has she ever complained. So out of respect for her, I thought, you know what? I don't need to call. I don't need to have this nickname for this doctor. 
why do I need to be disparaging this woman's looks with how difficult her job is? This woman had a great point. I can move on. Let's move on. I played the call on the air and it's funny how, how it separates everybody, right? Oh yeah. Because now you've got the, the guys that, that hate the politically correct world that we live in and they think I'm catering to this politically correct world. So now they're mad. So you're, you're constantly straddling this line in this business that we're doing. And then you've got to gauge, okay, well, do, do I actually continue to have this conversation on the air and continue to use this nickname and upset the people that might be offended, but I'm appeasing this crowd over here. Like right. you gotta, you gotta play this game constantly. And I'm not is... going to use that nickname anymore because she had a good point and she's not a Karen. She's not phoning me every week complaining about something. And I respected what she said. So I'm going to continue not to use the nickname, but it's just interesting the world that we live in. But then I can do a break about, you know, the fact that your Taiwanese dildos aren't going to get here because of the Suez Canal, right? I can have that conversation no immediately problem. following that and I get no complaints. Right. You're listening to the best of episode. Toddcast podcast entertainment guest visits are powered by Sacred Meds, the best craft cannabis and psilocybin dispensary in Canada. Available online at sacredmeds.com. Use promo code TODDCAST at checkout for 10% off everything in store. Music like that is being produced here in Vancouver. Just an absolute shit stomper of a song. The band is Arlo Wells. A new song for them, a new song for the podcast. It's called Dead Rat and was back and forth with Will from the band. Would be deadly to see those guys tear off the roof of the railway. You can't expect that to happen once the pandemic is in the rear view mirror. I cannot wait to see these guys live. I think that's going to do it for this one. Episode 249, A Little Bow on a Best of the Last Few Months podcast. Again, my name is Todd Hancock. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends. You can subscribe again on iTunes and Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube. We're also part of the Dean Blundell Network out of Toronto. Find Dean at deanblundell.com. Comment and rate the podcast. It helps out with search results and whatnot. Toddcast Podcast. Huge thanks to all of our wonderful sponsors. You can find links to all sponsor websites at toddhancock.ca. You can sponsor the podcast as well for as little as 10 bucks a day. It's cheap, like borscht. There's contact info at the homepage. Help us find a sponsor. We'll give you a commission based on the ad buy. Heads up. Till next week, don't be an asshole. Nobody wants to be around that. Have fun, play hard, and most of all, 
believe in yourself. The Toddcast Podcast. Keep in touch with Todd through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and bookmark ToddHancock.ca. Hi, I'm Alexis Ohanian. You may know me as one of the co-founders of Reddit, but more recently, a large part of my identity is being a father to my two wonderful daughters. In my podcast, Business Dad, I'm hoping to open up the conversation about balancing careers and family. The one thing I constantly hear successful people say, without fail, is that they wish they'd spent more time with their kids. That's time no one can get back. So I decided to create Business Dad to engage in the conversation about how we're spending our time now, providing a forum for successful dads to share their joys and challenges of being a working parent. You'll get to hear from a wide range of business dads, from Rain Wilson and Guy Raz to Todd Carmichael and Shane Battier. And while this podcast will talk about business and will definitely be featuring dads, I think everyone can learn something from these incredible conversations as we unpack the expectations we all have about careers, relationships, and ourselves. Business Dad is available now, so be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.